Uh, my name is Jamie Olson, and I chair the English department here at St. Martin's University. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth annual installment of the Les Bailey Writers Series. Les Bailey was a mentor to many here at St. Martin's, uh, faculty, staff, and, and most importantly, students. And he died all too soon from cancer on Christmas Eve in 2010. Not long after his death, a small group of friends and colleagues got together to do something to honor him, and this writer series and the endowment that supports it were one result of that effort. And by the way, I was just thinking today, uh, Les w it, it was from Pasco, right? Is that right, Pasco? Which is, of course, one of the one of the Tri Cities, and it, and and another of the Tri Cities is Richland, which uh, Kathleen Flanagan writes a lot about in her poetry. So he would really appreciate this this presentation tonight. I'd like to say a special thank you to those who have supported this year's visit by Kathleen Flanagan, including President Roy Hendricks, Kate Boyle, uh, the interim provost of the university, uh, Jeff Crane, dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and Amy Stewart Myatt, the new dean of the O'Grady Library, along with Mary Gentry and the members of the selection committee for the Les Bailey Writers Series, uh, not to mention Holly Harmon and Olivia Archibald, who serve on the Les Bailey Endowment Committee. That's a lot of folks, uh, but truthfully, this series couldn't exist without the collaborative efforts of all of them. And now I'd like to say a few words about Dr. Natalie Kiro Iwa Lewis, who will introduce Kathleen Flanagan tonight. Uh, Natalie is an associate professor of English at St. Martin's, as well as director of the Writing Center and the Writing Minor. She has a PhD in rhetoric and composition from the University of Arizona and two master's degrees, one in theater and the other in English. She's a passionate teacher of writing, and her areas of expertise include rhetorical theory and criticism, political rhetoric, the rhetoric of war, the ethics of discourse, and Greek tragedy. In her research, she focuses on presidential rhetoric and draws on investigative research methods to conduct critical discourse analysis of post 9-11 public writing or sorry, public government documents. At St. Martin's, uh, Natalie teaches academic writing, journalism, and creative writing. Alongside her scholarly work, Natalie is a wonderful poet in her own right and a member of the board of the Olympia Poetry Network. Uh, Natalie Kiro Iwa Lewis. So thank you so much, Jamie. And I want to thank you all to our audience for taking time out of your busy day and making this Les Bailey's Writers Series possible. So thank you so much for, for sharing your time with us today. Uh, it is a great honor for me uh, to introduce you tonight to a very special Washington State poet, Kathleen Flanagan. As you may know, Kathleen is an outstanding poet who has won numerous awards for her work, from the Prairie Schooner Book Prize for the first poetry collection, Famous, to the Washington State Book Award for her second collection, Plume. In addition to these honors and many more, she has also served as the Washington State Poet Laureate from 2012 to 2014, no small feat. Her journey into the craft from civil engineer to poet is a fascinating one that I'd like to share with you tonight. For many may wonder how this transformation came to be. So where to start? How to begin? Well, let me begin by telling you a story that I think does a good job of illustrating what some would call a one's magical awakening into the art. While taking a sabbatical from work at Hanford to take care of her two young sons, Kathleen decided to take a small break and attend some night classes. One of these was a course in poetry taught by Mike Hickey at the University of Washington. In her own words, Kathleen says of this experience, I fell in love with my poetry class immediately. I remember one night the teacher walked with me to my car after class and told me he thought I had real talent. I was so excited that I hit a post in the parking lot with my car and put a big dent in the bumper. <laughs> 
When I got home, I rushed in to tell my husband that the teacher liked my poems, and by the way, I dented the fender. <laughs> he was smart enough to know which was more important. <laughs> and yes, I think we can agree with her on that point. A fender can't possibly be more important than some good poems. Um, so from then on, Kathleen threw herself headlong into the study of poetry, reading and writing in serious pursuit. When studying Kathleen Flanagan's work, one thing that will strike the reader is the sheer versatility in her powers of invention. Diane Lockwood describes these gifts in her review of Kathleen's first collection, Famous, praising her for her insight, truth-telling, risk-taking, and compassion. She is a poet who has mastered technique and is able to do something unique, be brave, speak to our heads and hearts, and consistently surprise and delight us. To give you a sense of how Kathleen does this in all of her work, note how in Plume, her later collection, Kathleen subverts our understanding of the world in startling ways. Her poetry here, based on childhood experiences growing up in Richland near the Hanford Nuclear Reservation site, one of the most polluted waste sites of the Western Hemisphere, draws on extensive research of archival memos and, and transcripts. Through this poet's eyes, we are presented with up and close encounters of another side of Washington state history we don't always hear or know about. Take, for example, Kathleen's poem, The Green Run, named after the Green Run event of December 2nd, 1949, when government officials purposely released approximately 7,000 to 12,000 curies of iodine-131 irradiated short-cooled fuel straight into the atmosphere. In this poem, Kathleen shows us her spectacular ability to subvert our expectations and play with seemingly contradictory images, as in her first line, green, a verdant green, grass avenues framed by trees, juxtaposed later with images of belching stacks, forever injured thyroids and cauldrons a bubbling by its very end. Here Kathleen weaves a tale of betrayal, casting Hanford in the role of a tragic character caught in a Shakespearean mystery where forces run amok. Such envisioning of an imaginative world here is the purview of the stuff of great masterful poetry. Poetry that percolates and bounds off the page. This is the real stuff. Join me in welcoming Kathleen Flanagan tonight. Thank you very much. Natalie, thank you so much for that generous introduction. <laughs> Wonderful. And thank you all for coming. I have had such a beautiful day at St. Martin's, and I am incredibly honored to be part of this reading series, which has such stellar writers. Um, and I am in, you know, incredibly grateful to be here with you tonight. Um, I have met so many kind people. The faculty have been great. The students have been great. The administrators have been great. It's a gorgeous campus. It's just, it's been a really special day. And I'm really excited tonight to talk to you. I have a, a title, as you can see. My title is A Case of and For Poetry. So what I really want to do tonight is make a case for being a reader of poetry. And we'll see if I get away with that or not. Um, Okay, so I have, a, I have a few slides that will go with my presentation, and I am going to read it to you tonight, um, and then hopefully there'll be time for questions and answers after if, if you're interested in asking a question. There are so many things that I want to tell you. That reading and writing poetry changed my life, that it taught me to lead an examined life, as Socrates would have it, 
I want to tell you about finding poetry as an adult when I was already trained for a life in engineering, about my commitment to help our next generation of readers, you, to find a place for poetry too, about my search for voices to love and for my own voice, but also about the wildly shifting and expanding world of poetry, poets writing right now, ready to rouse our compassion and understanding of what it means to be human, American, of color, old, young, invisible, questioning, afraid, fed up, in love, alive. I grew up slow to know myself. Picture an afternoon in the 1980s, if you can. I am a 25-year-old graduate student in civil engineering, mind adrift in a shared windowless office. I, am, I have ripped a poem out of the daily university newspaper and tucked it in my desk drawer, and I can still feel it there. I recall reaching into the drawer to reread, to be sustained better than I do any classroom conversation, project, or meeting with faculty from that period of my life. The poem was called Duller by Theodore Redke, and it begins, I have known the inexorable sadness of pencils, neat in their boxes, duller of pad and paperweight, all the misery of manila folders. Duller means mental suffering or anguish. I don't imagine I knew the word, but from the inexorable sadness of pencils and the rest that follows, I recognize deeply the truth of my assigned desk and chair, the building vents blowing air on my neck, my columns of numbers, and stacks of computer code. The poem concludes, I have seen dust from the walls of institutions sift almost invisible through long afternoons of tedium, dropping a fine film on nails and delicate eyebrows, glazing the pale hair, the duplicate gray standard faces. Now, over 30 years later, I laugh at my younger self. I recognize as I read this poem, I felt in my body those afternoons of tedium stretching into my future, and yet I felt powerless to do anything about it. I tore the poem out of a newspaper because it spoke to me. The images, yes, but also the language, its particular arrangement and rhythms, its tolling bells, the fine film on nails and delicate eyebrows, glazing the pale hair, the duplicate gray standard faces. I heard it ringing for me. Did you think as I read those lines to you that next I might tell you what the poem means? What, for example, the dust symbolizes, what the gray standard faces stand for, you are safe with me. I am allergic to the term symbolism when applied to poetry. Where have we gotten this idea that everything in a poem is code, not what it appears to be? I too had that feeling back then in that beige office that I hadn't read enough of the Bible, of the Greek myths, to crack the code, that I wasn't learned enough and never would be to read poetry. And yet Dollar spoke to me. Seven years later, a rainy afternoon, this one a Saturday. I've shut myself in the bedroom with an anthology of poems from the local library. I've never done this before, checked out a book of poetry. My husband is in charge of our two little boys and their voices piping up from the kitchen are part of that memory too. Here I am with a book on my desert island and I start reading. I'm just like many of you. I'm afraid of the way poems look on the page, the semicolons, the line breaks, what I suspect is some kind of pentameter, the way extra syllables get replaced with apostrophes, the chalices that symbolize Christ's love. But here's what I have going for me. I am 32 years old, out of school for years, no assignment to turn in, no fear of being called on to perform an analysis of symbolism or scansion. It's just me and the poem. And here is a secret that opened the door that afternoon. I trust myself. Do I read the first line and feel moved to jump across the line break to the next line? Do I hear something in the language, a voice that calls me to keep going? 
And if it's a poem by Wallace Stevens, who I remember from English class as a genius, but I can't hang with his abstractions, his dark voice of the sea, here's what I do. I turn the page. I tell you that across a wide distance of years. I love Wallace Stevens now, but I didn't yet, not that afternoon. I turn the page, and it's okay. That afternoon, I found a poem by Ruth Stone called In an Iridescent Time. It's a sonnet. It begins, My mother, when young, scrubbed laundry in a tub. She and her sisters on an old brick walk under the apple trees. There's a washboard in the poem and a pet calf and bees, tossed braids and wet aprons. Here's the poem's last five lines. Four times they rinsed, they said, some things they starched, then shook them from the baskets two by two and pinned the fluttering intimacies of life between the the lilac bushes and the yew, brown gingham, pink, and skirts of Alice Blue. Reading it now, I hear a beautiful, easy, iambic meter and natural rhyme that rings but does not clang. But that's now. Do you know what shocked me about it then? It was a scene of women hanging the wash. Could that be a subject of a poem considered fine? Could a poem be about laundry? My favorite childhood dress was Alice Blue Gingham. Did that matter? It mattered to me. I don't know if Ruth Stone's poem could move you, but it moved me enough that I can still see myself there, reading, discovering, a moment my memory has preserved across 25 literal years. What if there was a new music, a sound you had not heard before? What if you discovered yourself in it? Your whole body loves it, the rhythmic complications, the surprising progression of chords. Or is it the singer's voice, its timbre, its vibrato, its tragedy? A poem can be that too, if you find yours. Like rate the record on that old TV show, American Bandstand, you want one that's got a good beat that's easy to dance to. You're flipping or clicking stations in the age of Spotify and YouTube. Imagine going looking for a new song. Click. A shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs. Click. The thing I came for, the wreck and not the story of the wreck, the thing itself and not the myth. Click. Step aside, please, while our officer inspects your bad attitude. Click. Somewhere, a sun. Below, boys brown as rye play the dozens and ball, jump in the air and stay there. Click. Jenny kissed me when we met, jumping from the chair she sat in. Time, you thief, who love to get sweets into your list, put that in. Say I'm weary, say I'm sad, say that health and wealth have missed me. Say I'm growing old, but add, Jenny kissed me. Perhaps the world will end at this kitchen table while we are laughing and crying eating of the last sweet bite. I need to break in with an aside. I am omitting from my discussion tonight at least one culturally and artistically significant category of poetry, spoken word. Spoken word poetry has welcomed voices that have been excluded and overlooked by the poetry establishment. But you will need another night and another speaker to delve into that form. I am a so-called page poet, and though I love to hear poems out loud and think poetry lives in the voice, I meet poems most intimately on the page where I can study them. Line breaks, white space, rhythms and repetitions detectable by the eye, all those silent but alluring visual aspects of poetry that contribute to a poem's effects. Back to the radio. I had a hard time tuning my poetry radio until I trusted my instincts and my page-turning ability. 
How did I find poets? I checked out books from the library, but most of what the local branch library seemed to offer to somebody like me who didn't know how to dig were dead white guys, and I wanted something new and fresh. I bought a few so-called literary magazines and contemporary books, which in those days, the 1990s, were not yet available online and required a trip to a good bookstore or a subscription or exchanges with friends. Oh, I made new friends, my poetry friends. I started taking a night class in beginning poetry writing taught by the wonderful Mike Hickey at the University of Washington Experimental College where you could take classes in poetry writing or flamenco dancing or 50 ways to cook eggs. I met others like me, enthused and searching, shy of being exposed as ignorant, which we surely were, but also wishing to learn. Out of that wonderful class, I met other new writers who were exploring, like me, and those friends have been my compatriots along the way. Poetry has led me down a path toward, not away from, life in all its incomprehensible glory. Poetry is often pointing towards the ordinary, like many of my favorite poems, windows into the daily toll and gift of marriage, friendship, the seasons, aging. Sometimes, though, poetry delivers insights about the larger world, the politically, socially, economically oppressed world. These poems are public poems, poetry that addresses the concerns of society, our collective condition as captives in a world order that feels beyond our control or our understanding. A world, a world for example, that starts war after war despite what we know about war. American poet Richard Wilbur once said, one does not use poetry for its major purposes as a means to organize oneself and the world until one's world somehow gets out of hand. I want to share a poem by Nobel laureate Wisława Szymborska, translated from the Polish by Stanislaw Berenczek and Claire Kavanaugh, which demonstrates true purpose. The end and the beginning. After every war, someone has to tidy up. Things won't pick themselves up after all. Someone has to shove the rubble to the roadside so the cars loaded with corpses can get by. Someone has to trudge through sludge and ashes, through the sofa springs, the shards of glass, the bloody rags. Someone has to lug the post to prop the wall. Someone has to glaze the window, set the door in its frame. No sound bites, no photo opportunities, and it takes years. All the cameras have gone to other wars. The bridges need to be rebuilt, the railroad stations too. Shirt sleeves will be rolled to shreds. Someone, broom in hand, still remembers how it was. Someone else listens, nodding his unshattered head. But others are bound to be bustling nearby, who will find all that a little boring. From time to time, someone still must dig up a rusted argument from underneath a bush and haul it off to the dump. Those who knew what this was all about must make way for those who know little, and less than that, and at last, nothing less than nothing. Someone has to lie there in the grass that covers up the causes and effects with a cornstalk in his teeth, gawking at clouds. I find the poem's simplicity, clarity, and timelessness brilliant. It's everyday language, it's very smallness, I am comforted by truth tellers even when the truth is painful. The poem's title, The End and the Beginning, perfectly frames the scene and comes back around to singe the reader. And though the poem does not forgive, nor should it, there is something about the way it names our human weakness that comforts me. I think we humans are comforted by naming and recognizing. I want to share another, more contemporary example of public poetry, this one by American poet Ross Gay, responding to the current tensions around excessive use of police force with African Americans. 
Recall that Eric Garner died in Staten Island in 2014 in a police chokehold. A small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Rec Horticulture Department, which means perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps, in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants which, most likely, some of them, in all likelihood, continue to grow, continue to do what such plants do, like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. Ross Gay's poem helps me find humanity in the aftermath of such senseless violence. The very gentleness of its argument, his use of perhaps and most likely, guides me gradually to an insight both moving and tragic and reminds me how fragile are plants and humans both. This poem helps me in part because it makes art of an ugly act. It literally transforms tragedy into a made and beautiful thing that can, if not alleviate suffering, shed light in a very dark place. Would that it were easy to give the poem a small, needful act to the wide audience I know is hungry for it. But how would a person even know to look for such a poem when the average American has been discouraged and scared off from poetry through, throughout school, often by teachers who were scared by poetry too. One of my life missions is to take the scary out of poetry, along with the self-doubt, so that readers might find the poems they need. You, 20 years from now, are leafing or rather clicking through an issue of The New Yorker and you come across a cartoon and read it, you smile or don't smile, then turn the page and see a poem and you try out the first few lines. That's all I really wish for. Maybe you think the poem is terrible and maybe it is. It's worth a shot. I believe you will learn to love poetry by trusting yourself to your own dislikes, to turn the page but keep reading by being open to poetry's mysteries without being intimidated by them. I believe passionately that the best poems, or at least the ones I love, are particular, planting in the mind the sofa springs, the shards of glass, the bloody rags. I can see myself most clearly in poems that brim with images and specifics rather than generalities. This may seem counterintuitive, I am excited by turns of phrase I have not heard before that surprise me and take the top of my head off, as Emily Dickinson famously described. Here's the 11th of the 13 ways of looking at a blackbird by Wallace Stevens. 11. He rode over Connecticut in a glass coach. Once a fear pierced him in that he mistook the shadow of his equipage for blackbirds. I have a friend in her 20s who, along with her fellow graduate school class members, selected a phrase from 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird to be tattooed on her arm. I think they each took a different line from the 13-part poem. Mine would be, if I were the tattoo type, the shadow of his equipage. Though he rode over Connecticut in a glass coach is no slouch either. Rarely do I think I could choose a tattoo that I could love forever, but I have no doubt about the shadow of his equipage. But better than any of these single phrases, I am caught in the whole of the little 11th poem, the strange foreboding, the ambiguous relationship to time and place, the menace of the blackbirds. It amazes me to consider Wallace Stevens was an insurance company vice president living in and rarely leaving Hartford, Connecticut. My personal mission includes instilling our youth with the possibilities in poetry. I've been working in public school classrooms for nearly 20 years teaching poetry workshops. I borrow for an hour other teacher students ages 5 to 18, but focus mainly on 3rd to 5th graders ages 8 to 11. 
For two years, 2012 to 2014, I served as Washington State Poet Laureate, and I made it my mission to visit classrooms and libraries in all 39 counties, and I was especially keen to get into the classrooms of third, fourth, and fifth graders. Picture them, the ones who dot their eyes with hearts and the ones who know books worth of facts about World War II, the ones counting down the minutes till recess and then lunch, the ones who struggle to sit and be quiet, and the ones who are happy to sit, and the over-medicated ones, the hand raisers and the blurters. Here is the method. I share a poem with the class, almost always a poem written for adults, but carefully chosen because it is tempting to imitate or emulate. Perhaps it's written in a form we will practice. Sometimes I put it on the screen for students to read along. Sometimes they just listen. I read it aloud once, sometimes twice, and then ask students what they notice. This is a neutral question, open for interpretation. It could be a pattern they hear or see or a simile they like. Simile and metaphor are the backbone of my work. Or they may offer a comment on the subject of the poem. Or it could be a question even about the meaning of a word. And I keep asking, what else? What else? Then the poem becomes a model for their writing. Poems are a window into children's logical and emotional minds. And they have a lot of curiosity, and they like to try on sadness and to explore grief and silliness. I want to show you a few lines written by my young students. First, I want to show you a poem written in a Malayan form called the Pantum, which uses a pattern of repeating lines. I remember Eric, a third grader, dressed regardless of weather in basketball shorts and hiding his head behind somebody else's head whenever I asked for volunteers. After I taught the students the form and they started writing, he approached me quietly to check if it was okay to quote somebody else's words. And I told him yes. And he continued that the fifth graders had put on a play that morning, scenes from Shakespeare, and he was still thinking about it. Could he use some of that? And I said yes. So this is what this third grade boy made. Death. To be or not to be, an old man breathing his last breath. Death is the road to the underworld. Death is silence. An old man breathing his last breath. Death is war. Death is silence. Death is whispering to a young man's ear. Death is war. The cemetery is the road to a new life. Death is whispering to a young man's ear. Death is life, but backwards. The cemetery is the road to a new life. Death is the road to the underworld. Death is life, but backwards, to be or not to be. I remember telling the class to try to make every line interesting. I'd say he nailed it. I believe you could find this poem in a book and never suspect it was written by an eight-year-old or the New Yorker. It's it is alert to the universal questions, the wrestling we each do our whole lives. So my tactic again, reading the poem first to put poetry in the students' heads, reading it first as a model of excellence, reading first. The first definition of a poet, one who reads poetry. More than anything else, I ask my students to make similes and metaphors. I ask and keep asking, what could you compare this to? What is that like? And what else? And what else? What is being quiet like? I feel like a cake topper frozen in my place. When I am quiet, I am the crab inside the shell and the invitation inside the envelope. What is this room like, this bedroom? The queen's room is like parking in a sea of china dishes. What are Van Gogh's sunflowers like? All looking at me with one eye in the center like I'm interesting. All standing up like waiting for a bus that never comes. And then there's just the joy and profundity and unintentional humor that makes working with children my favorite kind of teaching. This is, um, imagine a pretty little fifth grade girl. That's Emma. And she wrote, a little girl's journal. <laughs> 
Go inside a little girl's journal to reveal a note, a note that is written to a boy she admires. Let somebody else wonder what secrets are hidden inside. From the outside, you see a book locked with a pink fuzzy heart on the front. Yet within, I can smell a lavender field and see a sweet little drawing of an attractive petite boy with a heart on his head, the place where a light bulb would be if he had an idea. These little poems feel like gifts. I can't tell you how many times I have pulled out these and other writings by my young students and reveled in the naturalness of their metaphors, in their sometimes off-kilter but absolutely truthful vision of the world. I believe poetry offers these students a great gift as well. Poetry requires students to dig into and unearth their imaginations in an age when imagination is provided in an Amazon shipping box along with a charging cable. Poetry requires sensory recall in an age when so many of our children's lives are lived virtually on the other side of a glass. It asks them to be precise with language and teaches them the power of the perfect verb or glittering image. It lets children try on and wear emotions like anger, guilt, fear, love, safety. It teaches some of them to love revision, and it teaches them that they can surprise themselves, that they know things they didn't know they knew. What is this like? What is this like? This question leads up a trail into my own writing, though often I lose it in the weeds or I'm not fit enough to follow. Writing poetry has helped me synthesize and begin to understand my own life and identity. Through the first 10 years of my writing career, I stood face to face with my life as a woman, a wife, a mother, and a daughter. Poetry forced me to look closely at my existence. It led me to images and metaphors that explained my life to me. Well, I remember the afternoon. I fanned out 50 poems on my kitchen counter to go searching for a title for my first book. These poems were written over a decade of my life as my children were born, my parents died, I struggled to understand marriage, motherhood, friendship, yearning, disappointment, and the oldest subject, love. The title I finally chose, The Ironical Famous. In essence, the book explained to me who I was and how I had gotten there. I'm going to share a poem from Famous first. This is called Sotto Voce. Tonight, blame Kiri Takanoa infusing the kitchen with her aria. Blame the mixed bouquet of basil and flayed tomatoes and onions and one expansive high note blooming like a rose in fast frame. Here in the audience, even in middle age, a little voice sings from the back of the auditorium of my throat. Aren't all of us waiting to be discovered? Men and women enter the grand halls of regional sales meetings, pressing name tags to dresses and ties. I have been one of those entering hopefully, conducting delicate exchanges in hotel rooms. I have called those pale disclosures my life. Blame the cheap seats we bought in the balcony. We barely hear the little cogs in our own hearts. Mozart, they say, heard entire operas in a moment, second violins, a glaze of harp, heroic voices in the chorus, all clamoring to be realized at once. My genius may be small, but sometimes truth rolls right at me like a hard head of cabbage, and I see myself that suddenly draining the pasta. After the publication of Famous, I had a little crisis. What could I write about now? The poems about my familiar subject seemed like repeats of better poems I'd written before. Eventually, I turned my eye to a new subject that had defied me, my childhood history growing up in Richland, Washington, a so-called bedroom community for the Hanford nuclear site, the largest contaminated waste site in our hemisphere. I had not only grown up in Richland, but I had worked for two and a half years as an engineer at Hanford, two in the hydrogeology unit, studying the movement of groundwater and environmental waste towards the Columbia River. 
Hanford gathered us all together, our town, our community of us versus them. This subject encompassed my identity, my love of hometown and America, friends and neighbors, of our culture, which was patriotic, closed, secretive, resistant to the outside world and to self-reflection. I began writing poems about my childhood, about my childhood friend Carolyn's father and his death from a rare blood disorder, the result of chronic radiation exposure. That led to poems inspired by Hanford site history. And finally, poems that responded to what I had learned from my reading and exploring. This project became the poetry collection Plume. While it did not explain everything away, the poems I wrote about Hanford did lead me forward and give me the right and necessity to examine the past. Maybe ironically, I have had much more impact as a poet writing about Hanford than I ever did as an engineer working there. Some of the most difficult writing required me to respond to facts that I simply could not contain, no matter how hard I tried. I held conflicting truths in my head at the same time. My idealized childhood, riding bicycles and running in the yard on summer evenings, eating snow as it fell, and then the revelations of environmental contamination, and in the case of my friend Carolyn's father, illness and death. Here's a poem in which I can't begin to answer my own questions, but I can at least mimic the infinite looping that was happening in my mind. It occurred to me that the looping was much more like an engineer process flow chart, which seemed apt, so I took that flow chart as my form and my title and incorporated images of boxes and arrows from a typical flow chart into the poem as well. And it's a poem in three parts. Flow chart. One. When Carolyn's father died, I drew a box around his death and an arrow referencing my America, my protective box erected in the mind. This is how he died. Chromosomal mutation, boiling his blood and marrow, exposure to radiation, an arrow, a flush of arrows. And this was a circle of lamplight and Carolyn's grown voice on the phone and the arrow circling back to the box containing his death, containing a box, containing a box. Two. Carolyn dumps out on her dining table 30 years of exposure documents, one man's official lifetime dose, painstakingly recorded. Pencil dosimeter readings, whole body counts in cramped cursive. Radiation reported in units that keep changing. We study a yellowing questionnaire with boxes her father filled in. How many fish do you catch and eat each week? Where? What kind? Do you hunt local game? Local fowl? Yes. Yes. Too many. My God. Pointing trigger figure fingers to our heads. Charades for shoot me now. Three. One box contains my childhood. The other contains his death. If one is true, how can the other be true? I think at first I must choose a box to believe in, but I'm all American and lightning quick with the shell game. Since the publication of Plume, I have struggled to write poems, but maybe that simply mirrors my struggle as a woman aging in a youth culture, as an American in a charged and troubling age. My poems are perhaps more ambitious and come slower and with more uncertainty. I think they are done and they're not done. It often takes two or more years to finish a poem, though I have several poems going at any given time in various states of completion. I would have expected more ease at this stage of my poetry writing life, more mastery. I am still a student of poetry as I am still a student of my life. My newer poems blend the personal with the public because it is human to take the news personally. Horse latitudes. And horse latitudes is that giant garbage gyre in the Pacific Ocean. Horse latitudes. A raft of debris as large as Africa accumulates in the Pacific gyre. Trash, plastic, rope, netting, 
a synthetic sea of flotsam that will outlive us all. Few ships enter. A windless ocean strikes terror in the crew. If you can't imagine the camera pulling back, pulling back until we see the curve of the earth, pulling back to reveal the atmosphere's blue glow and still not bounding the garbage, if we can't acknowledge the damage done, then recall your secret hurt that churns and churns and won't diminish, a spiral so huge your mind mutinies and denies it all. Musicians don't have to justify their existence, nor do they write books called Why Music? And yet, since Percy Shelley's essay, A Defense of Poetry, in 1821, and most especially in the last 30 years, there has been a rash of essays and books defending poetry and the premise that it deserves to be read and even exist. For example, Dana Joya's Can Poetry Matter in 1991, David Orr's Beautiful and Pointless, 2011, Ben Lerner's The Hatred of Poetry in 2016, and in 2017, Why Poetry by Matthew Zapruder. Poets are perennially and traditionally pessimistic about the future of our art form. We poets are the Eeyores of the literary world. But something is happening, something big. The age of the internet has finally caught up to poetry. We wondered for years how it would manifest and thought it might be limited to the online literary magazines that spring up by the dozens each month. A little disappointingly, most online poetry publishers are the same as the old print publishers and run on the same rules, only worse. In the old days, poets didn't often get paid, but we at least got a copy or two of the magazines that published us and sometimes even a subscription. Now, with the advent of online publishing, we don't even get a copy of a magazine. Are you getting a sense of us? Though our culture claims daily to hold up poetry as the highest art form, even my Safeway names its floral section, Poetry in Bloom. Poets know the truth. We are second class citizens in the art world, the only ones who make less money than unemployed actors. The ones who are expected, not just willing, to show up and read for free and pay for our own gas. Um, though certainly not St. Martin's, that's not true at all. <laughs> but there is more happening than just publishing in online journals. Movement and change are coming and the future is shockingly and scarily alive with the possibility of gasp and audience. And another equally important possibility, equal access to audience for voices of every kind. Maybe you are already aware of a phenomenon called Instagram poetry. How many of you have heard of Instagram poetry? Anybody? Okay. According to Teen Vogue, and let's pause for a moment to consider that Teen Vogue has written an article to teenagers about poetry. The great thing about Instagram poetry is that the poem has to fit inside that cropped square. The article goes on, short poetry isn't necessarily easier to write because it requires the poet to pack a lot of emotion and symbolism into a very small space. There's that problematic symbolism again. Like an infestation of bed bugs, symbolism in poetry is scary and resists scrubbing and even fumigation. Quoting again, Instagram poems are about love, loneliness, and the human condition. Some Instagram poems are mostly typed pieces. Okay, I can't tell a lie. I worry when font styles become the main feature of a piece of literature. <laughs> but I acknowledge, too, that I sound like a fuddy-duddy who thinks pizza isn't a vegetable. Who are the next guard of Instapoets? That's what they're called, Instapoets. Their names like Atticus, R.M. Drake, The Poetry Bandit, Amanda Lovelace, Nikita Gill, and of course, R Rupi Kaur. Surely you've heard of her. This is an example of, of uh, one of her Instagram poems. What is the greatest lesson a woman should learn? That since day one, she's already had everything she needs within herself. It's the world that convinced her she did not. <laughs> 
My criticism, if for a moment I may expose myself and voice one, is that the poem makes necessary an illustration, and it's a very beguiling one, because it's lacking an image. Instagram proves a following, in some cases a massive following, and that's significant to publishers. It isn't necessary that R.M. Drake, for example, boasts a celebrity fan base that includes Khloe Kardashian and Kylie Jenner. Any proven audience makes book publishing risk-free in a publishing culture that literally charges poets to have their poetry manuscripts considered, since poetry rarely sells well enough to cover the printing costs. Did you catch that? Poets have to pay to have their poetry considered for publication. Poetry publishers make their money off manuscript reading fees, not sales. Putting it bluntly, more people write poetry than read it. But here is a new platform that supplies a fresh and increasing readership, the gold standard for any generation of poets, where there are more readers than writers. It's a minor miracle, no matter what I or my fellow dead poets may think of the poems. Yes, I have my reservations about much of this work. Writing poetry is not about saying something, it's about making something. And I feel many of these insta-poets are trying too hard to say something which prevents poetry's magic. Putting it differently, I sense that the writer knew what he or she was going to say before it even hit the page. This is the antithesis of poetry, since writing and reading poems is an act of discovery, of surprise, of beginning in a known place, but then following the language and images into the unknown and unpredictable and into truth. But this popularity is all new and far, far from hopeless. Amanda Lovelace says, some people call us insta-poets to differentiate us from real poets, aka dead white, straight, cisgender males. Nikita Gill described in Marie Claire magazine as a 30-year-old London-based writer rejected by 137 publishers before she self-published her first book, maintains that a majority of this movement is led by people of color, specifically women of color, who have found a different way of presenting their writer to the world, their writing to the world. Just for a moment, I have to say that 137 rejections is nothing. And this is a picture of a box of just some of my rejections. Mostly now I get them by email. OK. I'm struck two ways. First, I admire anyone who can build a new audience for poetry where previously there was none. And that is what's happening. A recent survey by the National Endowment for the Arts reveals that poetry readership doubled among 18 to 34 year olds over the past five years. I salute a forum democratic enough to welcome underrepresented voices, voices that need to be heard so that they might open hearts and minds, voices that catch hold of new readers stunned to see themselves the way I saw myself so many years ago in that poem of women doing laundry. Second, I feel sure that Amanda Lovelace is not really reading much quote-unquote real poetry these days. Conventional presses that once favored to the exclusion of others, the old and dead white guys, are finding and featuring new voices. Three examples. Saeed Jones, who wrote Prelude to a Bruise in 2014, is a public presence as an on-camera host of a BuzzFeed news show. Fatima Asghar, author of this year's If They Come For Us, wrote and co-created a popular web series, Brown Girls, now being adapted for HBO. Eve L. Ewing, author of Electric Arches, published in 2017, is a sociologist and commenter on race with a massive social media presence. All have been published by established, influential presses and are representative of voices gaining note with books, awards, fellowships, and gradually editorial and teaching positions. I believe it is these voices, too, that are forging new, excited audiences. The Internet is democratizing poetry. Poetry. 
Yes to the diversity of voices. Yes to the insistence that poems can be about the ordinary, also about the headlines, also about identity of all kinds. And yes to this tsunami of voices that rolls over the old guard, hugging the Norton anthology in a death grip. This new wave is a life force. Yes to diving into the wave and searching for poets that speak to you, trusting your dislikes and most of all your loves. And here's to tomorrow's Instapoet sensations like Eric, age eight. Thank you very, very much. So I, if I'm available, if you have questions, I'd love to hear them. If you, if you do have questions, please, please uh, uh, use the microphone because this is being taped by Thurston Community Media and they can't hear you without the microphone. Cool. Um, and I think we have students who will run the microphone to you if you don't want to come up here. Have you got a question, or are you a microphone runner? <laughs> oh, microphone runner. OK. Raise your hand if you have a question. Hi. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I had a question. Uh, writing about a subject as serious and sort of catastrophically depressing as uh, Hanford, how did you sort of balance, I guess, your poem site, which I haven't read, um, to have some sort of positive energy in them? Well, you know, the, the weird thing about, the and the reason that I wrote about Hanford is I don't think of it as this catastrophic historical event. I think of it as my hometown and my childhood. So it, for me, it was extremely personal. And it's just like writing about your family or writing about your neighborhood. That's That's what I was writing about. And so um, some of that is good, and some of it's funny, and some of it's black, and, and a lot of it was sobering, but it had that range of emotions for me. Um, so I think that's why the subject, it wasn't, a, I don't think of what I wrote as a political book, I don't think of it as activism, I really think of it as a book about identity. So, And that's, I think, one of the reasons I'm so... I, I feel like sometimes this, this what we're, is getting called identity poetry is getting um, some sort of pushback. But I, I feel like that's what brought me to poetry, was seeing finally seeing myself in some poems. And so I can really identify with that idea of you've never seen yourself in literature before, and now suddenly you're starting to see yourself in it and how powerful that is. It's really important, really important. Yes. You had a, a line that humans are comforted um, by naming, and I didn't catch. And recognizing. And recognizing. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about how your naming and recognizing has evolved from in this process of hearing your own voice and recognizing resonances with other people? I, th I think um, another way of saying recognize, um, recognizing or naming is, is trying to find something that feels authentic or truthful. Um, and I think those are the poems that you keep coming back to. So I think in the process of learning what works and what doesn't work, you have to learn to listen to yourself and, and keep coming back to poems finding why they're calling to you to keep working on them. Um, so that's I think that's the first step. And then when you're lucky enough to find a reader or someone who re responds to it, that's so gratifying. But I think the first step is just you are your own first audience and trying to find words for things that you didn't think you had words for, I think is I think that's what all writers are writing for, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I had another thought about the transition uh, from the original matriarchy 
symbolized by the Venus de Willendorf, ancient classical statue uh, found in the Austria area. But in Greece, particularly, uh, the transition from matriarchy to patriarchy, you have the Furies. Mm -hmm. And the one power that remained to women was naming. Oh. Uh, my mother named an element from the fission products laboratory in the Oak Ridge reactor, which was the pilot reactor for Hanford's reactors. Mm. And the two chemists who discovered the element in my father's laboratory uh, went to my mother, a recognized poet, and said, will you help us name it? So my mother's story was never told mm -hmm. until much more recently. And uh, I, I cling to that as a comfort, that the power of naming is very important. It, that's, it's uh, 61. Prometheum. She said, you're like Prometheus. You've stolen fire from the gods, and mankind may suffer for it. Mm. It was prophetic. Very poetic. Um, that makes me think about, um, I, so many of my Hanford poems were inspired by reading I did, especially by a, excuse me, a historian named Michelle Gerber. And it was not lost on me that so much of the truth telling that has happened about, around Hanford has been by women. And I don't think that's an accident. I think they're the ones that, you know, push for a little bit of truth. Not that men don't like truth too. I don't mean that. I just think I think there is there is some relationship with, you know, trying to find yourself and naming. I think naming is a, a female trait maybe. M more maybe it's both, but women do have that desire, I believe. Thank you for that. Hi. What would be your advice for people who feel great pressure when um, trying to free write or write in oh. general? I really identify with that feeling of great pressure. Um, putting so much pressure on yourself to write something great every time you sit down and write. So I think the very best way to deal with that is to um, set aside a daily writing routine so that and it could be at the same time every day. Maybe you are an early riser. You could say from 6 to 6.30, I'm going to free write. And I'm not even going to look at it for two weeks afterwards. And you just do it as a, turn it into a pattern so that there's not so much weight on each individual piece to be great. Because that's just impossible to deal with. I think you just sort of try to make it as regular and just like breathing. It's just something I do, not worry about. I'm going to write about something. I'm just going to write a phrase and then see where that phrase takes me. And just kind of go easy on yourself. And I think that's how you can kind of ease your way into a more comfortable reading pattern. Of course, I don't do that. But I think that's really, really good to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a, I have a, uh, Christopher Howell, who is this amazing poet from Spokane, he, he does everything right. He, like, he sits down in the morning, he has one of those long yellow legal pads, and he hand writes. He just writes and doesn't worry about it. He puts it away. He looks at it, like, a month later. He does it daily. And, and, and he writes, like, book after book after book. And they're stunning poems. And so he's my model. And some, someday I hope to be able to achieve that. In some, But I haven't yet. My uh, question is uh, kind of going back to uh, the children. And they had some very good, wonderful things out there. <clears throat> but uh, my question would be geared towards uh, when you're you're dealing with these children, you have the children who are self-conscious and uncertain, and I can't write poetry. That's stuff you have to have rhyming all the time, and I can't rhyme. You know, my stuff's not going to be as good as everybody else, and people are going to laugh at me. How do you deal with that? Well, you know, the truth is that it that's something that's, that 
comes in later. That's actually more of an adolescent feature. My experience with children is that they're very unselfconscious. They're proud to share what they've written. And if they can get a laugh off somebody or they can get people to listen and think, wow, that's kind of neat. I never thought of it that way. And they do. They get a really nice response from each other. Um, they they really are, are very open and sharing of their... That's one of the reasons I love working with them is they aren't self-conscious. It's late. It's it's when adolescence starts, like 12, 13, 7th, 8th grade. That's when they start really, they worry what other people think. They're worried that what they said is dumb or they don't, you know, they don't want somebody to know what they're thinking about. And then they, that's when they get sort of covert. The problem that I have with children is they're worried that they don't have anything to write about. That's their fear. Their fear is that they're going to sit and stare at a white page and they won't be able to put anything on it. So my task is just to sort of slather them with, you know, poems and words and instructions and here's five things I want you to do and be sure to write a simile. And, you know, so I give them a bunch of stuff they have to do and then they have to just get down and get going with it. And I give them vocabulary and you know so they're just sort of surrounded with stuff and then you know sometimes they still have days where they can't write but usually almost everybody has good days and bad days so I, I take the good where I can. <laughs> Since you've uh, drawn on your own life and history to inspire your writing have you been inspired to write on the tedium of civil engineering at all? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have, you know, I have poems in my book Plume, which were written after many years, many years of trying to harness what I knew about civil engineering and poetry and putting them together. So that, that took me years to do, and I feel like there's a couple of poems in there that actually achieve that, and so that, for me, was a great victory. <laughs> and now I'm ready to put that sort of to rest. <laughs> When, when the, um, the young man was asking about um, the, uh, how, do you, how do you avoid the pressure, and your answer reminded me of William Stafford, who wrote oh, yes. a poem a day. And, and we, were when, in, we were in that Stafford. Yeah, pro you yeah. taught me this. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> do you want to tell the story? No, no, you do it, yeah. <laughs> um, he, he basically uh, was in an interview, a radio interview, I believe, and uh, he was asked about, you know, how do you, how do you write every day? I mean, in terms of, you know, how do you write something good? And, he, and his response was, I just lower the bar. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, yeah. My question for you, you is, for um, you talked about your insecurities early on. What did it feel like to be, be awarded the, be, to be the Washington State Poet Laureate? What was that? Um, when you got that, how did that feel? Well... I, um, you know, it's a job, I, people wonder about the Poet Laureate program. It's actually a job application. I don't, you actually apply for this position and you're competing with other people. And the way that you apply is you, um, you sort of, you know, lay out your qualifications. And I had, I had been working as a poetry editor for a number of years um, at Floating Bridge Press where we published Washington State Poets. So I had a really good feel for the poetry writing community in the state of Washington. So that was one. I'd done a lot of teaching in the school, so I felt like that I had strength there. I had one published book, but I, I felt good about that book. So I, I felt like I had the basics. But what um, really kind of got me excited is you have to propose a project. And you get to propose what it is you want to do. They don't tell you you're going to do X, Y, and Z. You say, I planned to do this, that, and the other thing. So for me, it was, I want to get to all 39 counties. That was important to me because I was from Eastern Washington, and I remember what it felt like to get left out of stuff. So that was really important. And then the other thing was I wanted to focus on third, fourth, and fifth graders. And so I made that my my sort of business plan, I guess. And I knew that when I was being weighed against other candidates, they were looking as much at my project as anything else. And so that kind of made it feel less personal. And once I got it, I was, I, I, of course I felt wonderful about it, but I felt like this is something I know how to do. I, I know how to go out there and teach um, and talk about poetry and talk about loving poems and getting poets together and having them read. And I, I know how to do those things. I've done them before. So, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Um, as one of those people that went through school and 
uh, Robert Frost, uh, The Wall. Loved the poem, but at the time hated it because of what my teacher put us through. <sighs> yeah. um, I'm considering being a, a teacher of English in the uh, secondary education, and you mentioned that the 12, 13, and above are in those. And I've got a 15-year-old boy, and he's in that kind of mode. Yeah. How do you, in your uh, poet laureate and the friends that you have, how have they bridged that gap? How have they got their attention and allowed them to, to write? To do this. Well, I think bringing in examples of poetry that speak to them, so finding poets that, that they like, that's, that's part of it. And they, they don't know what they like. You have to bring, you know, bring them a lot of different things, and they, you know, it's like they'll find somebody in there. Um, that's one thing. And then making, making the classroom feel safe for sharing or just, just working. You know, they don't have to share. They just need to feel like they can they can safely work on their own stuff. And I, I actually find that teenagers don't have trouble writing. They have things to write about. They have things to say. It's just they don't want anyone to know. They want to feel like they can show, show it to a teacher in a safe way. It's not going to get um, called out in any way. So I think there's that feeling of safety, examples that are really quality, um, exemplars of poetry that helps a lot um, and just bringing lots of poems in you know just talking about poetry and not and not putting that frame on like what does this mean what is this a symbol of that stuff just kills poetry and there's still you know there's this wonderful innovative writing programs that I've seen you know there's one called writers workshop that tries to bring in writing in very innovative ways into the classroom they still do a terrible job with poetry I've seen the the you know the way their discussion questions are just terrible they're terrible they would make you hate poetry I would not want to have to answer those questions so you know, I think the the idea of neutral stuff, like what do you notice, what do you like, what's a word in this line that pokes out at you, or you know, there's ways of doing it that it doesn't feel like they're going to get the wrong answer. I think that's just super important. Somebody's late for something. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your listening, and thank you to St. Martin's. Had a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you.